Hi everyone. So we are back for our session with Chris Condren, event source systems expert, and we'll be talking about understanding event sourcing as a storage choice. Hello, Chris. How are you doing? Good morning. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm doing great. Right early here on the east coast of the United States. Oh, and what what time is it uh, there? Yeah. It's just about 7 a.m. 7 a.m. right in, in Mauritius, right now it's about uh, 3 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is why I chose a late slot. It's late slot, yes, of course. How is the uh, situation over there in the States regarding uh, COVID-19? Not good. But yeah, Not we're, good. we're muddling our way through. I mean, in uh, Massachusetts, things are going very well. Numbers are down. You know, people okay. are doing the right things, masks and social distancing. But yes. other parts of the country are not doing well. Yeah, well, that's, that's a very important thing is uh, social distancing. Uh, in Mauritius right now, there is no, no active cases, I would say, on the street, but rather imported from other countries. So we can move a bit more freely and go to the nice. beaches. That's a bit good. So, that's awesome. Yeah. So I will leave the, the presentation view to you, Chris. You can start whenever you're ready. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about event sourcing as, as a storage choice. A lot of times people talk about event sourcing, they talk about is it a pattern, is CQRS, you know, a pattern. But that really sort of misses the point that event sourcing is about what your database is. Right, and a stream database is a database designed to do event sourcing. So today I'm going to talk about traditional, you know, relational databases. You know, RavenDB is one of the document databases you can use. Uh, Neo4j is a graph database. And on the right, we've got the way I represent, you know, event stores, you know, as a stream database with a stack queue and the database sort of booked together. So eventually we're going down to a choice. In your application, what do you want to use for your database to best serve your needs? What database you're going to use as a big decision in how your entire application runs, and the right database can make a huge difference in your success. So the answer is very simply that it depends. So we're going to walk through the fundamentals and we're going to answer in this my understanding of when to use which system. So <clears throat> I'm going to start off with my history with storage, right? My background. Um, in 1990s, I got started with telecom. This was back when in the US we were first doing voice over IP, fully packetized switches, um, lots of distributed things. Back in the late 1900s, this is what's called a Schroger switch where the actual rotary dial would move these to create wires that would go across the country. 1960s, we started to get the finger switches with the national. This is one of the original number one five ESS switches for the national backbone. And then as I came in, we started building out new national switches with fully packetized networks where all of the phone traffic was event sourced. Not event sourced, event driven, it was all messages. We weren't really event sourcing, it wasn't stored. The databases were still relational or mainframes, but all of the packets going back and forth and all of that data processing was all now message and event based. Then in the 2000s, I moved into large SQL databases at insurance companies like really large, complicated relational databases. You know, this is a diagram of one database that was used in a company that had multiple database instances. And this is the um, one of the core tables surrounded. You can just barely see all the various store procedures. So this is an example of a large centralized system. Um, this company also had mainframes. Um, hard to change, hard to recover. Everything comes to the central office. 
And then in the 2010s, about 10 years ago, I started in finance and trading, um, wealth management systems, large accounts, dealing with the stock exchange. Here we've got a lot more in terms of audits and history and fast disaster recovery um, that we need to deal with. Um, and in truth, it's not just about consuming all the different trades and everything off of one exchange. We actually have to deal with multiple. We've got here New York, Hong Kong, London, doing a follow the sun approach to trading. And now what we're really getting into is distributed systems. You can't have this work if everything's coming back to that one central database that we had in the insurance scenarios, where most times insurance, you're not dealing with stuff that's real time. These systems were starting to get to what we consider now cutting edge, where you've got to have strong disaster recovery, pools of services running hot, hot, strong audit needs, um, failovers, you know, the beginnings of what we're going to see today in cloud architectures. So then 2018, I joined Event Store. Actually, this first, um, this first introduction here with Event Sourcing and Financial Services, I was actually I am one of the first customers for Event Store there. So I want to start with understanding really what the strengths of a relational storage is. You know, we need to understand, you know, why relational databases are the foundation um, that most people still use today, right? They offer both first and third normal form um, structures. A first normal form you see on the right it's a broad, flat table that's really optimized for reading um, and fast access. And on the left, we see a set of tables that are all related with foreign keys with a strong schema and very sparse data that give us a very fast update from an operational point of view. It gives us a, you know, a very compact you know, don't repeat yourself kind of approach to storing your data. Um, and so one of the real powers of the relational database is it can deal with both this, you know, tight um, form and third normal form for the operational data and this read or, you know, reporting data in these large flat tables that very often duplicate data. You know, the address you see here on the right will be folded into an individual table over here in the third normal form. One of the other things that you're going to see in a relational database is a really broad set of tools. We've got store procedures that can update tables, tables that can fire triggers, and we have this whole process that can move us between different things. We're going to see that there's a lot of ETL tools, extract, transform, and load. We're going to see ORMs. This is going to allow us to build data warehouses um, and do different um, pushes out to different types of other relational stores in that data warehouse. And then down here on the right, one of the things that's actually very interesting about relational databases is they provide what I'm going to call magic. Um, because transactions, the ability for my application to create a set of changes to a whole bunch of data, and the, effectively the world is going to stop for any readers or writers to that database and until all the transactions that I put into the log file are written into the data file the world stops, right? It lets my logic not have to deal with the asynchronous nature of what's really going on. The fact that I'm sending data to another machine, that things can change, that 
under the covers, those tables are going to be updated one by one. So I don't have to deal with a whole set of complexity here when I'm using this relational database. Um, and as long as I can have that model where I'm in a single, you know, single location, a single cluster, I know there are some distributed systems that can expand that out, but I still need to be able to lock in order to upgrade, update all those fine thermal form tables that we've got. Um, and it also really allows us to bring data together, it allows us to, by its very design, you know, have joins, have relationships, pull data together. So key features, again, third normal form, we have a nice compact online transaction processing portion of our data. First normal form gives us a nice efficient queries because we don't have to join anything. The caller can just go look at that one large table. This is the foundation of all your reporting databases. We can have defined table schemas. Um, we can join that data together and we can have those transactional commits where we just sort of stop time. So with all of the power that I just talked about, got a ton of tooling, it's well proven, it's very performant for what it's doing. Why do we need NoSQL? Why do we need these other database types? Why do we need a graph database? What, what does that give us? You know, if you think about what it takes in order to be able to um, do a hierarchy, just take a standard organizational hierarchy and fold that into a single table. And you're going to find that it becomes a very, very hard problem to store that hierarchical data, data correctly. The joins become very complicated. The ability for the system to be able to parse that out becomes very slow. Updates become problematic. So that's one of the things. The other thing that we're going to find is that you know, those nested hierarchies, questions about networks. If you think about what um, LinkedIn does, um, how you on Facebook, how LinkedIn gives you that list of potential connections, how I can run a query across that graph, the structure of the data inside of that relational database. While it does provide tremendous power and has all those toolings, in these cases, it actually performs very, very poorly. So while I'm not going to necessarily run the entirety of my platform or my system on a graph database, although in some cases I very well may, there are other parts of the system where I'm going to really want to model those connections, those graphs, you know, how do all the roads connect in a city? How do I measure the distances to do a, a mapping application? Trying to model that into a relational database, you're just going to lose your mind. Um, another very common NoSQL database is a document database. Um, this here is the logo, as I said before, of RavenDB, uh, one of the more popular document databases in the market. Um, just picked at random. Um, and what it allows you to do is to create a series of documents where now the updates are transactional on the individual document. Some databases allow you to do multi document um, transactions, but primarily the idea is that each document is a large um, blob of data with an independent schema. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have all my data around an employee in one document. But that allows me to have a different schema for different types of employees. I might have one schema for contractors, a different schema for 
regular employees and a third schema for um, senior management or board of director, you know, members. Um, I can also have entirely different types of documents in the same system. And then I can do updates on those. And some of these systems allow me to do um, revisions and roll back changes. So this is going to give me a very powerful system where I might want to do something like content management, where I really do want free form data. I might have some rules about it. My system might interpret the data in there, but it's not like that rigid schema that I had back in my relational database. You know, I don't necessarily know or have the time to do a full data model across all of my content before I can have it. I also don't need to enforce the same schema across multiple different documents. The schema is fundamentally within that one document. Um, and then, you know, this can also be wonderful for things like um, catalogs. So what if I've got, you know, I'm running Amazon and I want to have a different catalog item that I'm going to present on the screen. So content management, catalogs, user stores, anything where I'm really going to say the schema of this item is independent, the schema and the version of this item is independent from other instances and other types. And I don't want to necessarily be required to find that schema up front. So now let's talk about a stream database, you know, or an event store. Um, in particular, a stream database is a system that provides event storage in the terms of multiple independent streams. <coughs> so the writers write into an individual stream, and we can see here that I've got the stream identifiers in black. And I've got the master of all positions in orange. So someone writes in the stream one, that's the first event in a common log for the whole system. And then someone writes in the stream two, right? The first event there is the second event. Then we can go back to the stream one, events three and four, sequential in the first stream. And then we go down back and forth. And this means that while we're writing individual streams, the system is storing that data as a general as a general log for all of the different events in the system. And this allows us to keep. So unlike in the relational system where we saw that we're joining tables here, each stream is independent. We're guaranteeing an order in the stream and we're guaranteeing a global order. Um, and we're not going back and changing or mutating any of the previous events that we've written. Um, we're just appending new events to that master log. We can truncate streams, we can delete streams, but we're not gonna ever modify them, right? And then at the bottom here, we have a projection. And what this shows is the ability for us to create a projection, like the one I'm showing here, where suppose we want to have a projection of the first event in every stream. We can link, right, and that's what this dotted line is saying, that we're going to create a virtual stream, much like a materialized view in a relational database, of a different ordering of the events in the main log that presents a virtual stream that can be consumed by a reader. So this allows us to create a cross-cutting stream of, say, all of the creation events like we did here, or all of the um, error events or closing events or migration events as their own stream to be able to process. This stream, this projected stream, can actually bring together multiple individual streams as well to allow us to create a category. For example, like all of my um, invoices 
So I can, might have each stream as a single invoice, and I'll have a projection which is all fundamentally the same way we saw in the relational database with the third normal form schema and then the first normal form schema. We still have that same concept here where we're going to have event readers and our event consumers and event writers. You know, the core limitation here is that the event writers can only write into a stream, while events consumers can read from any stream or the all stream or a projection. Um, one of the other, you know, and generally we're going to write our events into the database in that third normal form sensibility that we saw back in the relational database. One of the themes that you're going to see me talking about here a lot is that the fundamental work of database science that we see in relational databases still applies in full to any storage system that you want to use. You know, if you're using a graph database, you still want to think about data retention. You still want to think about schema. You know, same thing for a document database or a stream database. And really what's happening here is that the event store is acting much like that transaction log that we saw in the relational database, where the inputs are coming in, they're being written to that transaction log, and then a relational database, they're persisted into the table format and the log is discarded. Here, that log of changes is the database. Right, we've sort of turned that database inside out and created that log as a first class citizen. And then we have our event consumers then building whatever is needed for the applications. This, this is where that CQRS pattern comes in, where we're separating out the side, one side of the database for writes and another side of the database for reads. One of the benefits of this is much the way, you know, in a relational database, that transaction log is then used to populate the relational database. Another use here is that we can use an event store as the core of a polyglot data uh, solution. That means we can take the events from the application, record them in the event store as a primary store, and then tie that into having adapters that give us a graph or a relational store or write out to Kafka or a document store, right? Any one of these options is valid. Now, I'm not saying that if you have all these stores, you should always put an event store in front of them. If your system can run independently, we have a relational database and a graph database, as many do today, then this is required. However, if you have cross-reporting needs, if you have uh, distributed backup and restore needs, so you have a disaster recovery where you need to know exactly where everything is and restoring all of those to the same position, we can use the position in that core log because we have global ordering and linearization of every change, we can use that position to know where we are in these other sources and that allows us to restore that back to where we are. So the key features of a stream database versus other tools you might use to store events, uh, which can be used to do some event sourcing but aren't really stream databases. The first one I'm going to really talk about is, you know, fine grain streams. You want a system which allows you on those writes to have millions of streams, millions of independent sequences. You know, you want to be able to have for every instance of something in your system, you want to be able to have a stream. That's because in order to update it, you're going to want to read it to know what state it's in now and 
were stored. So having that fine grain stream allows you to have these fine grained operations on your data. You're not going back and replaying millions or billions of events in order to be able to create some state, populate a writer, decide on a new event, and then publish it. Um, the next thing we're going to want is sort of a guaranteed sequence, sequential numbering. So in those streams, you know, one of the characteristics of stream names is providing you with sequential numbering in the stream. This is tremendously important when we're looking at doing things like um, distributed messaging. You know, knowing that if I see event seven before I see event six, I'm out of order, simplifies a whole number of problems we see as regular occurrences in distributed messaging. Out of order delivery, repeated delivery, missing messages, it allows you to go back and query when you miss a message stream. <clears throat> also, if you add in an ability to detect staleness, that will also solve most of your distributed messaging problems. Um, global ordering. One of the things that really struck me when I was, you know, dealing with reports in finance or different systems is reports often pull data from multiple different databases. And if I need to rerun or recreate a report and those different sources are not in the same position, I'm going to get a different answer. And the business really, really doesn't like it when the same report gives them two different results. So having global ordering of all of the separate things that are occurring in the system allows me to know that if I replay logically everything, I'm always going to get the same result, no matter how many different systems are in play. Optimistic concurrency allows me to say, you know, I'm going to write to the stream, but I read it at position 10. I'm expecting to write at position 10 again. This is critical in our microservice scenarios. When I've got lots of semi-disconnected independent operations all running, I've got a pool of services that are servicing all of my invoices, right? I might run into situations where they each pick up the same invoice and they both try and make a change. So do I lock everything and slow everything down or do I use an optimistic pattern where the first one will get right in and then the second one gets an error telling me that it wasn't something changed while it will handle that replay and apply the change. The ability to do push notifications out of the system is also really powerful on the read side. Not forcing queries to come back and always read the system allows us to build reactive applications where the system is going to send us data out and it's going to allow us to dynamically update things when a change occurs rather than constantly pulling and putting load back on that central server. Immutable data is one of the things a lot of people have trouble with in the beginning. Um, some people worry that the database size is going to become enormous. Um, in truth, I find that most well-run event stores are smaller than their counterpart relational database that has any history or audit tables. Those tend to just grow and grow and grow. Because you can have junk eight streams, move data, and migrate, it is perfectly possible to have standard data retention policies, data tiering policies, and apply them to a stream database. But what immutable data does give you is the ability to understand cache eviction. Because you're not going to have to worry about, you know, is something wrong? Has something changed? You can always use that global position, which is the next item, to know if you're stale and if something has changed. But once you're at a position, you can always trust your system is there. Um, position and the sequential numbering, now we can do positional queries. So if I know I've processed up to event 9 million or two, I can query from that position forward. 
to see if there's any changes. Or I can go back in time. I can go back in history and see what it looked like 300 events ago and replay that forward and maybe try something different. Um, we're also going to want projections or stream views in order to be able to see constructed streams that now match our current view or a view of interest that is not how the data was written into its original streams. And the last one is that streams are by their nature isolated. This means that we're now more suitable for microservices than we would be in a system which joins data together by its nature. So let's get back to what we were talking about before. So if you've got a traditional application, if you can have a relatively local system, I'm not talking about, you know, has to be a single machine, but you can run a cluster, you've got a local scope. Um, if you've got a lot of legacy investment, if you've got a strong set of team skills around relational databases, in those tools, those ORM type tools, you're building into your systems, then you're really gonna wanna look at using a relational database. You know, if instead you're looking at a distributed system, you've got something which is by its nature, you know, in multiple different areas, um, you've got different producers, different consumers, um, you've got it deal with how do I coordinate and roll back and recover, right? Having a single number, you know, a vector clock, if you will, that represents the current state of your entire database is tremendously powerful. Um, having the ability to use all of the log distribution patterns that are well known and well used in the industry to distribute this database out to wherever it needs to go, either in a local cluster or uh, replicated into different regions. You can do that. Um, then you want to consider using a stream database. If you've got microservices, you can relax the, every microservice has its own database to say, well, what if every microservice has its own stream, right? or in each category of microservice has a category of stream that all work together. And you can leverage that isolation to give you very predictable results on the microservices that are producing events. And also microservices <clears throat> and event processing works really, really well. So you've got message and event driven systems. If you're looking at a modern distributed system that'll there's no impedance mismatch between an event sourced or stream database and those, those event driven systems. So with polyglot data um, as well, so we can leverage that log nature of a stream database to fill out in-memory caches, um, relational databases, you know, all these different things can be fed and kept up to date and managed in a reasonable way using that core event store as a source of truth. And then any place where you have audit and history requirements, this becomes worth its weight in gold. You know, oftentimes what I see, and I saw this in, you know, different areas, is that the while it takes a little bit of work because you do have to do, you are, you do need team skills, you need a different approach, you've got to do different data modeling. Although in truth, it's not that different than what you're going to do for a proper relational model. You don't have to then go build a set of audit tables, a set of history tables. The number of systems, relational systems I've seen where Maybe when the database was first rolled out, audit and history were perfect. But as that schema changed and as features are pushed in and things about audit and history 
were never kept up. You couldn't actually recover the state of the system from the audit tables or the history tables. They could be used for some research as opposed to an event store where audit and history are the foundation of how it's built. They're first class systems that you can't escape, you get for free. So that's really the core things that let you decide between that traditional database or a stream database as a storage choice, right? You know, how am I going to do HA and DR? How am I going to do distributed, right? If I don't need to do those things, then I can leverage the magic, you know, that transactional magic of a relational system that allows me to lock, you know, everything across the board and make a change, as opposed to a stream database where you really have to sort of deal with the fact that you're going to update different streams in different orders, and that's going to give you a different fundamental log of what happened. You know, you're not going to lock the whole system while you update stream one and stream two and stream three, right? You will get, if you up, drop three events into stream one, yes, they'll go all together. But you sort of have to face up front that distributed nature of the system. You have to face up front the fact that how I'm writing the data in the system is going to be very different from how I read it. But that also allows you to simplify things, right? We're not violating the single responsibility rule, right? Where it's great to have a tool that does everything, there's a cost to doing more than one thing. And here, what we're really looking at is dividing things out into different independent components where each one is simple and they can be put together in a trusted series a chain that proves out the fundamental point. So I think I'm a little bit early, but uh, now I'd love to have some questions. Thank you very much. And it was a really informative session and on pointing out the different scenarios where a uh, relational database or a stream database must, might be more useful. And still, do we have any questions? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Chris, for this awesome presentation. I uh, was wondering, uh, is do you have any top uh, use cases for StreamDB? Um, right now, so I would say training systems. Uh, I've done in medical imaging and medical science where we're doing things that are going to require government oversight and audit. So run for FDA approval on drugs. Um, so hospitals are a great use case. Anything in the medical industry, uh, legal industry, financial industry, um, all of different flavors of that financial industry. I've also found that there's a lot of other places where people are um, getting a great power out of it um, just with that audit capability. The other big one I'm finding is it's, in my estimation, it's the optimal database for microservices, right? So if you're doing a microservice solution, you've got lots of independent services running. The nature of having independent streams works very well with that, gives you a simple way to model it, a simple way to interact with it, and then you can either drive that out into your distributed log to go into different places, or you can uh, create a read model right there that you're going to then expose to a standard application. OK. Uh, to so, my understanding, StreamDB works great with uh, millions of streams of data. Uh, but yes. the challenge regarding that comes to the classification of data. And uh, one part of computer science with, which uh, tries to solve this uh, problem is machine learning. Is there any uh -huh. way that could be implemented together? So. Um, <clears throat> So what we're doing is we're doing a stream per instance, where in a relational database, you would have a table, and then in the table, you would have a row. Think of a stream in a stream database as a row in that table, right? So I would have a whole category, 
which is the table, and then instances, which are the streams, right? So that's the way to think about the first level of categorization of the streams. So I might have like, you know, multiple different categories and then instances of that category where each instance is its own stream. Now, intersecting that with machine learning, one of the wonderful parts about event sourcing is you get all of the data. So machine learning is all about your training and your data sets. So one of the problems with a relational or other database where you edit data in place, right? People talk about CRUD, create, update, delete, right? Um, it's really create, delete, right? So you create a record, you delete the record, you recreate it. You're actually destroying the old record. So as I take snapshots to feed into my machine learning models from my relational database, I'm losing the full actions of the user. If I was using it to map my system, I get the full path they took through my application. And I can now feed that into my machine learning. Okay, thank you for that. Indeed, uh, I myself, I am trying uh, Kub uh, Kubernetes services right now. And you've mentioned it, uh, uh, Evesto works great with microservices. Is there any resources that developers can find? Um, there's a, there's resources on the event store website and all of the standard um, literature around event driven systems uh, will apply to this. Um, the one caveat I would say, you know, one of the reasons I, so I would not recommend some of the patterns I've seen about event sourcing directly on a distributed log like Kafka because it doesn't have some of the key features in terms of optimistic concurrency, because it'll just accept events into it. And if I want, like if I have one stream that represents my bank account and I lose my bank card, and I have one event that comes in that's me locking my account and another event coming in, which is someone drawing $1,000 from an ATM because they got my, my ATM card. I don't want both of those events to go in the stream. I want one to win and one to fail. Um, so it's much better to think about, you know, you're going to have an application with a database and then it's going to communicate with other applications over your distributed logs, right? And a stream database can be one of those backends and has a very low impedance with a distributed log because they're very similar to each other. I can take the events from my stream database, transform them to a public event, and publish them out onto that distributed log. And now I get all my repellability, my guarantees about commits. You know, I can run my microservice and I can still get all the distribution I want from that distributed log, right? And then I might have another system that reads that log and then updates a different application database from that distributed log. And okay. they play together really well. Uh, I Yes. So yeah, uh, thank you for this very insightful uh, presentation. I've just learned uh, uh, event stream DB myself. Neil, Neil also is from uh, Event Store in Mauritius. He's a DevOps engineer. Uh, Neil, anything else? Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. So yes, thank you for the amazing session. I think it was an awesome introduction to stream DBs and when it needs to be used and maybe when not. And thank you. Chris Condon, hope to see you in our of conferences. Thank you very much. Have a good day, Chris. Ahead. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye, -bye.